Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Marguerite Winter, Manager of Public Programs and Partnerships here at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. I'm pleased to welcome you to CABS and Dialogue series presented by Hyman Auctions. The current edition of the Chicago Architecture Biennial, The Available City, continues to be on view now through December 18th. This afternoon's program, Traces of, Future, of Past Futures, taken from the title of Manuel Hers, Architect and Central Park Theater Restoration Committee's Biennial Contribution, explores the collaboration and process in developing the site-specific installation while reflecting on the neighborhood of North Lawndale and the future possibilities of the Central Park Theater. Our panelists this evening include Blanche Killingsworth, the president and co-founder of North Lawndale Historical Society, an organization whose mission is to research, educate, and archive the history of Lawndale. She is a longtime North Lawndale resident and community activist. Mary Lou Sidel, the director of community engagement for Preservation Chicago, working throughout the city of Chicago to save significant built and natural environments. Her current projects include leading a community-driven planning process in disinvested neighborhoods to identify what is important to the community and strategies to keep those places intact. Toshona Marshall, native of Chicago, is passionate about the work in the North Lawndale community. Outside of her work as HR hiring manager for Bird Dog Media, She's an ordained minister, assisting Pastor Marshall with the work of serving the North Lawndale community through service projects, meal distribution, and housing. Manuel Hers, principal of Manuel Hers Architects, a Basel-based architectural practice that is embedded in research and is operating on a wide range of typologies, locations, and scales, from the architectural to the urban to territorial. And our moderator, Anne Louis, Founding partner for Future Firm, a Chicago-based architecture office. Her work focuses on the role of architecture as an infrastructure for discourse. Please note that this program is being recorded this afternoon and will be available for you to view after on our website and YouTube page channels. Please also feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the program for any questions that you might have for our panelists. I will now have hand it over to our moderator. And thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, thank you so much, Marguerite. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm so excited to be here today uh, and to help moderate this panel of um, some really amazing people. Um, I've had the honor of working with the Central Park Theater Restoration Committee um, for two years now, since 2019. Um, and that organization is made up of uh, folks who are here today, uh, including organizations like Preservation Chicago, uh, Jewish United Fund, um, the House of Prayer Church of God in Christ, uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Office of Engagement, um, and the North Lawndale Historical and Cultural Society. And then um, starting last year, um, uh, we were honored to be invited to participate in the Chicago Architecture Biennial um, in collaboration with Manuel, uh, whose work you'll hear about today. Um, and I'm super excited to be able to share with you both the work that's been going on at the theater, um, uh, the team's vision for the future, um, as well as uh, Manuel's uh, installation, which you can see um, at the theater today. Um, so for the organization of today's event, uh, I'm going to, uh, in a minute, hand it off to uh, Blanche, um, who will be presenting the, her uh, about her work. Um, she'll be followed by Mary Lou Seidel, and um, then uh, followed by Manuel, uh, and then followed by Tashona. Um, at the end, uh, I'll kick off a panel with a few questions that I have for the group, um, but we're also super excited to hear questions and answers um, from those of you who are attending through Zoom. So please uh, shoot questions in the uh, Q&A function along the way as you have them, um, and we'll come back to you uh, at the panel. Um, on that note, um, Blanche, inviting you to come back uh, uh, into the screen with us, and I'm going to share screen, and um, please let me know uh, when to advance the slides. Thank okay, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne Lou. Uh, first of all, welcome, everybody. I'm here to just give you a glimpse, if you will, of North London. 
The North Londale community is an integrated part of the city of Chicago from the establishment of the Czech Bohemian area to the Jewish establishment, once known as the Holy City or Little Jerusalem. Um, what I do want to tell you about the North Lundell Historical and Culture Society slide has partnered with and engaged many elected officials on our work in North Lundell. As you can see here, our congressman is standing with side, outside of his office after having conversations with him. Next. And then we also established the North Mundell African Heritage Garden. This garden is established on 12th place in Central Park with this continent of Africa in the middle. This garden was established in 1999 with the assistance of the Staines Family Foundation and the Botanic Garden, next. We also incorporated into our research and studies of North Lundell an independent asset map with the assistance of the School of the Art Institute. This map shows you historical sites in North Lundell, as well as a guiding tour of the richness of North Lundell, next. The North Lundell Historical Concern uh, Historical Society was able to work with many partners in North Lawndale, assisting with the establishment of the Contract Buyers League. The Contract Buyers League, which included uh, the result of the uh, redlining process that was being done in North Lawndale to the establishment of why North Lawndale is in the condition that it is now. Next. We also partnered with Stone Temple, one of the oldest synagogues in North Lundell, where Dr. Martin Luther King spoke and gave his speech when he came to North Lundell. He actually came here and lived here and worked with us on contract buying, red line, slum lords. Next. We also did an area shot of North Lundell showing the closeness of downtown. As you can see in the picture on a distance is the Sears Tower. Well, we have the Sears Tower also in North Lundell where Sears originally started at. Next. That led us to conversations with the House of Prayer, better known as the Central Park Theater. This theater has always been a community theater. And when I say that it was established by the Balaban Katz family, as well as designed by Rap and Rap, this theater also held a closeness to the community, even when the Church of God in Christ took this building over. The past Reverend Lincoln Scott engaged the community by giving resources after school classes as well as food giveaways, clothing giveaways. This theater has always led us to a richness of North Lundell. North Lundell. North Lundell also has this iconic building on Central Park in Roosevelt, which the Central Park Restoration Committee is looking forward to restoring. This theater is the mothership of all the theaters in North Lundell, all the theaters in the city of Chicago, the first mechanically air conditioned theater. I myself went there as a child and enjoyed many shows and movies at this theater. Now, as I said, I'm telling you just a glimpse of North Lundell history. The North Lundell history, North Lundell Historical and Cultural Society has made a mission of itself researching, educating, and documenting the history of North Lundell. Conversation with elected officials had led us to many avenues. Many of them had their meetings at this theater. What I do want you to understand about North Lundell, we are an intricate part of the city of Chicago. This neighborhood uh, established back during the Czech Bohemian area, to the Jewish establishment in North London, once known as the Holy City or Little Jerusalem. 
to the African American community fighting contract buying, redlining, and the establishment of the contract buying league. We have made it our effort, we have made it our position, the historical society, to educate not only our community, but the world of who we are. And as I said once before, a community builds a neighborhood and a neighborhood builds a city. I hope you understand and I hope you enjoy the presentation this evening and just having a little glimpse of North Blundell. Look at Route 66, 3.2 miles of that route in North Blundell. We are a community. This is a community building that you're looking at here. A building that was established, like I said before, by a family led by a family. I want you to know that North Mondale is a beacon of light for the city of Chicago. We do shine. And once again, I tell you, welcome to North Mondale. And Thank you so much, Blanche. The beautiful introduction. I'm gonna click through these remaining slides. Let me know if there's anything you wanna say about these. As you look at this theater on the inside, think about Benny Goodman standing there on that stage. Think about Michael Jackson standing on that stage, Jerry Butler, and I can go on and on, but the condition of the theater now, yes, it needs help, but look at the beautiful condition that the House of Prayer has put this theater into. I welcome you to walk that out like I did. I welcome you to enjoy this theater. Come on, take a look at us, see who we are. Thank you. Um, Mary Lou, I will kick it to you. Yeah, sorry, I uh, got it so comfortable there. I always like listening to Blanche. It's like my favorite. Uh, <laughs> historian and storyteller. I just, uh, I could listen to her talk for days. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mary Lou Seidel. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Preservation Chicago, and I am really thrilled to be here and a part of this work and involved with the Chicago Architectural Biennial. Uh, Anne, you can advance the slide. So uh, I like to I like to show this picture because we started our work as a as a, an organ as the Central Park Theater Restoration Committee. Um, we had about two meetings before the pandemic hit, and most of us never met in person. But <clears throat> if you can see Dio Aldridge in the upper right hand corner of this image, and Blanche rightfully at the center, and Pastor Marshall um, and the, the and, and Tashona side by side, as well as Anne and Jane Charney with the Jewish United Fund. And, and myself, this um, this was the forming group, but it started with Dio reaching out to Blanche and um, and the outreach just kept growing. So it, uh, it always starts with people. People are care about these places, people have history of these places and people bring it together to find solutions for restoration. You can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to put up a lot of the parts of things we have to think about as we bring this project from uh, let's, you know, let's restore the Central Park Theater to getting it to completion. Um, every week, it varies what we have to focus on, but, um, but we are, you know, we're, we started out with research and partner building. Uh, we've been working on political support and fundraising. We uh, have at the very core of everything we do has been community engagement. Every member of this team is an equal and respected part of the of the effort, but ultimately our bosses are the people of North Lawndale and the and the people who care about this historic place. And our most important partner, of course, is the New House of Prayer Church of God in Christ, which uh, under the leadership of Lincoln Scott in 1971 purchased this building, kept it as a community hub worked with the resources it had to restore it. And um, we are almost 100% certain that the theater would not be standing today if it wasn't for the church's remarkable stewardship and protection. Um, 
I, the partnership that we have is really incredible. It's grown from those, you know, seven people we have, I think nine people actively, Jake Chernoff from JUF is involved as well, and Max Chavez from Preservation Chicago. But we have a core group of nine members who um, spend, we meet about every week or two, sometimes more, to get this work done. <clears throat> Preparing for the Chicago Architectural Biennial was an extraordinary experience for all of us. Gave us a chance to really share what we're doing with a larger audience and bring in the incredible work by Manuel, who was just remarkable to work with. Again, via Zoom, because none of us could meet. There was a travel ban, so we couldn't get together in person uh, with Manuel, but we're hoping to very soon. Um, I want to, uh, I think you can go to the next slide, Anne. I wanted to share a few slides because, and this is a beautiful, if anybody's, you've seen some images of the interior of the, of the theater as it is now, thanks to the work of the church, but this is what the theater space looked like. And we, we up until recently did not have, I did not see any images of the interior. Used to, as you can see here, there used to be paneling, um, there was a drop ceiling to reduce the cost of heating the space, but uh, just recently, despite all of our research, suddenly these pictures appear and we're able to get them. You can go to the next one, in. You can see here again, um, the drop ceiling, the, the choir loft on the, I believe that's for the choir on the back behind the screen, um, but the theater space just in the last I think these were, and Tashana, you might be able to confirm, I think these were about 2004, they had an event here um, and showed a movie at the theater. And you can go to the next slide. And again, I just think for me, these are great. You know, any, we, we encourage everybody everywhere to share with us pictures, but you can see if you've, if you've seen the inside of the theater now, how much progress has made just to get it back to its core, um, its core character in history. And you can go to the next slide, I think. Um, oh, I think there's a slide missing, or there was a, there's some formatting. That's okay. Uh, we are, I just wanted to share, this is the front, these are some blueprints of the front of the space. What we are really, one of the biggest challenges we're coming across <clears throat> is <clears throat> the idea of uh, whether we can do incremental preservation and restoration. And whether we, because we, can we activate the retail space on the first floor and the office and commercial space on the second and third floor at the front of the building where there are fewer code violations, um, which would bring the front half of this building to life, generate some income for the theater and allow us to continue our focus on the restoration of the auditorium itself. So I'm gonna show you the second floor on the next slide. You know, this is some beautiful space that's completely could be developed completely separate from the theater space. We do have um, our, our director, the commissioner of Department of Planning and Development, Maurice Cox, has expressed support for this kind of preservation where you can tackle smaller bites of a space. You know, restoring and, and uh, opening up this front space uh, is something that we can do on a much quicker timeline than the auditorium itself. Um, you can go to the next slide to shows the third floor space. And again, we have very, really great space on the third floor. Um, and you can go to the last, I think that's the, the next slide is the last one. I love this picture because here we are at the Chicago Architectural Biennial event on September 29th, all wearing our custom Central Park Theater shirts. But this is the first time most of us have, were able to meet in person. And it was a really, really glorious day celebrating Manuel's mural and the work of the artist who did it and the community that was there. We played, um, what is that, bags. We had all kinds of games and artwork and crocheting and, and it was a really great fellowship of community. I do wanna note um, throughout our work, we've had a lot, a lot of support from Landmarks Illinois. They worked a lot with the theater before the restoration committee was formed on cleanups and uh, you know, getting power to the to the theater. They've also supported the restoration committee's work with a grant. They've been an integral partner, and we're really grateful for their support and involvement. We also had a building condition assessment prepared by Wis Jenny Elsner, and we've had IFF involved as well, uh, helping us provide sort of a strategic plan and vision for the space and work out some of the the numbers and how to make it work. 
Uh, not to mention, not to mention the least of Anne Louie and Future Firm. She has been an incredible resource bringing to our team and volunteering her, her support to uh, get us to the place to re be ready to launch this. I do want to mention really quickly that early on, Dio Aldridge uh, kind of drafted some core values and goals that the group settled on. And we, we, we recite and, and review those goals throughout our get, getting together. And anytime new partners join in, we make sure that they can sign on to a commitment to value these priorities as much as we do. And they include um, the need for the community voice, ensuring that um, the economic impact is centered on community-based individuals and does not impact autonomy and ownership for the house of prayer, that we acknowledge issues of race, class, religion, and other forms of oppression exist and are at play in the community of North Lawndale and in the history of the Central Park Theater itself, and that the ultimate revitalization goal is to create a multi-use community space that will allow for, for retail, commercial endeavors, uh, community spaces, and continued use by the House of Prayer. And again, that the additional uses for the space will be respectful of the spirit and values of the House of Prayer, Church of God in Christ, the stewards and owners of the site since 1971. And with that, I will pass it on uh, to the next person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Lou. And I feel like I need to make a plug that we now have the t-shirts for sale after popular demand at the yeah. event. Uh, and, I'm, can, and I'm wearing, uh, <laughs> I'm wearing mine right now. <laughs> which you can... Um, grab to also support the effort. <laughs> uh, Manuel, uh, I'll hand it to you and just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Thank you, thank you, Anne. Um, uh, wow, I would love to have one of these t-shirts, uh, Mary Lou. <laughs> um, Thank you, Anne, um, and and uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I wanna um, speak a little bit about the, the um, installation that we've set up. Um, in Chicago. Uh, but before that, I just uh, to contextualize it a little bit in the rest of my work, uh, allow me to show uh, very quickly a few of the projects that I've had a chance to work on in the past uh, and, and then move into Chicago. And if you move one, one slide, next one. Um, uh, uh, and and they're uh, kind of one could say uh, in many places of the world and and uh, quite a, a very different uh, program. So this, for example, is a synagogue uh, that I recently built in Kiev in the Ukraine on the site of one of the worst massacres of the 20th century of the Holocaust um, that uh, kind of uh, remembers uh, the this massacre, massacre, commemorates the massacre, but also in a way celebrates the beauty of life and is meant to look forward. Next one. Um, uh, next one, Anne. Um, Anne, yeah. Uh, and uh, is also meant uh, to bring in a kind of a new ritual into the site. It uh, actually opens and closes. Um, this um, is a, a hospital I recently built in Eastern Senegal um, that uh, is very much embedded in the local community. Also, everything has been constructed by the local community with materials of the local community and works very much with climate. Next one. Uh, and um, is the uh, maternity and pediatric clinic uh, for the largest city of Eastern um, Senegal. Next one. But uh, while we were constructing it, uh, we were also working on much smaller projects uh, like this one. It's a, it's a school that actually grew out of a test facade, a school in a small village 50 kilometers south of, of Tambacunda in a village of maybe uh, 200 people. Next one. Uh, and uh, on a very, very different uh, kind of a seemingly different scale, different uh, program, a housing project in Zurich um, that also has, and maybe this is something that, that uh, characterizes my work has this kind of performative uh, uh, dimension. It actually opens and closes. Um, next one. Mm, uh, so the building can completely shut, uh, uh, almost becomes this kind of mystical, uh, seemingly technical device uh, and open and unfold. Uh, next one. And then last uh, but not least, 
a project that I've done with refugees of the Western Sahara who've been living in refugee camps for the last 50 years <clears throat> in, um, in southwestern Algeria, where um, the architectural production of the refugees themselves in the camps uh, was um, kind of uh, um, represented through tapestries uh, that uh, we were developing together with the refugees and, and were woven in the camps. Next one. Uh, and and uh, then exhibited in Venice, but also amongst others uh, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, where this tapestry was acquired. Actually, the first acquisition by the MoMA of uh, a piece of uh, a kind of artistic production by a refugee collective. So um, the, the the work that I'm dealing with often deals with collectives, often has this kind of performative uh, dimension, and and this intrigued me. Um, of course, when I received the call from Anne and David, <clears throat> next one, to work uh, on this uh, fantastic theater uh, in Chicago. And uh, I was thinking, what uh, kind of what can I do? Um, what can I bring also a little bit from the outside? And um, next one, uh, I was looking at the at the context. Um, and uh, I found it quite remarkable how this um, majestic theater that uh, Blanche has described so beautifully uh, and um, how it sits in a, in a kind of awkward position um, next to a parking lot, next, next to a green lawn. Next one. Um, and um, it has this kind of almost sculptural uh, quality. But when I was looking at older photos, next one. <clears throat> I noticed that uh, 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 that it was actually not uh, this kind of uh, a solitary building, next one, but um, it had a kind of continuous streets, streetscape. It was inscribed in a continuous streetscape. And over the time, I figured uh, North Lawndale, and maybe this is stating the obvious, um, had transformed uh, quite a lot. Uh, next one. So. Um, what we see today, <clears throat> uh, an urban fabric that uh, is half built, half unbuilt, um, uh, uh, with uh, the, the green sites in between the buildings, uh, is a very, very different North Lawndale from the North Lawndale of 50, 60 years ago. Next one. <clears throat> and um, I think uh, it came out very beautifully in the description of, of Blanche how North Lawndale was really the center or one of the major centers of cultural social production in Chicago. <clears throat> and these kind of continuous street, streetscapes um, are, are in a way, a, a, let's say, a physical uh, manifestation of this density, uh, this hub that radiated out from North Lawndale all over Chicago. Next one. <clears throat> and I, I, I kind of uh, wanted to hint to that. Next one. By um, looking at the uh, the empty lots, uh, imagining what could have st stood there in the past. Next one. What kind of um, stories, narratives uh, were taking place there? Uh, next one. And then also uh, looking at the elevation, and, and this is just an illustration. Uh, next one. Uh, of the this kind of uh, uh, wi wide wall of the theater. Next one. And also imagining in the past, um, this is not what it looked like, next one, but it was also um, uh, touching uh, existing buildings and in these existing buildings, next one, uh, a kind of lives were taking place. Uh, uh, music was written, music was performed, love uh, uh, stories uh, uh, took place, uh, uh, an economical exchange, social exchange, next one. and. Um, and we somehow wanted to represent this density of life that was in the past and that will also take place in the future. So Anne uh, brought in wonderful artist Thomas Melvin, with whom we collaborated, uh, who developed uh, this, this mural, next one, uh, that uh, suggests uh, uh, both the history and uh, the future, the past and the present and, and the future, an outlook of um, bringing some of the main actors of, of um, not Lawndale, Benny Goodwin, Martin Luther King, uh, Dina Washington, uh, kind of in a performative way onto the wall, merging drawing and, and, and architecture. Next one. And um, emerging uh, 2D and 3D physical um, manifestations and, and representations, 2D representations. Next one. <clears throat> 
to uh, suggest uh, not only on the facade, but also on the floor, uh, kind of the, the footprints of the buildings of the past and, and suggesting how this can density could kind of um, uh, uh, start off again. Next one. Uh, and in a way, this is uh, what it is. It's, it's a, a, a kind of a promise from the past to the future uh, how North Lawndale will uh, uh, kind of and can figure with the center of the theater uh, as one of the key uh, places of Chicago again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. And um, it's in incredible to see the, the work again, uh, even just, just on screen now. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about it together. Um, I'll hand it over to, to Shana. I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I'm in, working in the office. Um, so I um, first, I am very honored to have the opportunity to talk about this project and who we are, what we believe, where we're going. And then um, as I sat and listened to those who work on the team, worked on the team with me and um, my dad and free of charge, just giving of themselves, I'm, I'm humbled um, as I began. And so I want to talk a little bit about where we want to go. Um, we've done this work, we've envisioned that where is this going? Where, if we, when we restore the space, what is the ultimate goal? And so um, looking at that framework is something that we'd like to discuss, but at the same time talk about how we can't ignore that we're in North Lundale um, and even how the CAB event has helped even start the work of what we believe in. So um, starting with the statement of need, one of the things that I think is important to note is just to understand the North Lundale community in its entirety. And um, to do a little research historically as to where we are and why the House of Prayer um, has felt strongly about the Central Park Theater being restored, but also um, about why it, this restoration is beneficial for the community. So first, we're in North Mundale. This community has 28.4% of the resident site. They don't have a high school diploma. 75% make less than $20,000 a year. 18.5% cite if they were unemployed. And overall, we have 38. 4% of them living below the poverty threshold. Huge issues in North Lundale. And so what would a theater in the middle of all of this do? How is this, this framework? How can we come in and just have a place where there's just church? Um, how can we come in and just have a place where um, we're just doing present um, performances? It, that theater has to be more than that. It has to be a hub. And so what you heard Miss Blanche talk about, what you heard Mary Lou talk about, what Manuel has discussed are all the ways of where we're looking at the past drawing from the past and pushing forward. So as I look at the next slide, here is what we really envision we see. We see the Central Park Theater as an agent of change. It's going to be a, a, a space for both cultural and creative hub when you bring together history, but at the same time, you have this creativity, this creativity that pushes the community, that heals, um, a community space for adult learning um, and community education, continuous education. One of the things that the founder of House of Prayer um, really believed when he bought this space, negotiated the space in 1971, was that you have to have a space where people can come and talk. And if you hear the story ever told, you'll, you will hear him talk about having, you'll hear them talk about how he brought gangs that were violent and fighting each other together to have a meeting to cease fire. He has always believed that vision has always been that this space will be a space where you can really bring the community together and educate them and change. And so that's really the vision as well. And and provide a space for creative learning and experiences where children could come, where adults could come, and they can really express their creative energy in a way that heals the community versus destroys it, and then engage the community um, and empower the community through ho a holistic approach to healing. And the most important piece for Pastor Marshall is restorative justice, that instead of prisons growing, that we are able to take those who may have been involved in different heinous activities and bring them 
them together and have them be restored to a place where they're able then to be a contributing member of society. And so we do that. We have to believe that this center, this Central Park Theater has to be a multicultural hub. It has to be a place where you activate storefronts for jobs, but you also partner strategically with the right people in order to um, create the opportunity for the community to have a creative expression. That it's not just about coming to watch a show. It's not just about um, fixing a theater so we can have church or fixing a theater so that people can come and have an assembly, but it's actually a place where we want city elected officials to say, you know, have you heard what the Central Park Theater is doing? Let's send this group over there and let them um, be changed and impacted. Um, there's a team over there that's working that we believe that can really ensure that they are healthy and whole um, if you work with them. Um, one of the things that um, the CAB event even did was that, um, so the Central Park Theater um, is right across from Hope House, which is a community-based um, transitional housing complex. But just this event alone um, allowed for us to employ six people, six people who were not able, they were having struggles with paying their bills. They were they had been unemployed during a pandemic. They did not know where extra income was coming. Um, and we saw firsthand just having this event, what it would do to impact the community. And these six people talk about and have talked to us since about how they were able to help with their bills, how it really gave them a, 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 a leg up. And it inspired us to realize that just if we're able to mobilize the community with this one event, what could we do if the entire theater is renovated and now we have storefronts and jobs, creativity, and all of this happening right there, what a difference it could make. My last slide is this. Um, we believe that uh, that change through programming has to occur. So we're in talks right now with different organizations, but that one of the most important piece, pieces is that you have to have the right programming in the right place. And we know from research that artistic expression is the link to the social, emotional health and well-being of an individual. That being able to um, act out or, um, or draw or, or creatively express poetry. All of these things are ways to heal social emotional, um, social emotional uh, issues that may occur um, in the individual's life. And so we want to cause that programming to be available in North Lundell through this theater, that it could be a place where there's healing, there's a systemic approach to it, it's holistic health, that not only are we tackling mental health from the, the perspective of of having a counselor, but you have creative role plays, puppets, things that will bring together healing in such a way that we are impacting the entire North London community. Um, we, we want to address the problems that the community is facing. We recognize that um, limited education, we recognize that um, systemic poverty, that all of these things create generational issues that you see repeated. If we can create programming and have this theater in a place where it is able to offer this and to be this hub, we then not only uh, effectively um, restored the theater, we've restored the community. And so ultimately, when we look at the future of where we're going, what we want, what we need, what's important to the vision of the theater, the, the, the restoration group, what's important to the church, um, it is all about creating programming that's going to impact the community, that's going to be sustainable. That's the most important piece. Um, we give out turkeys um, during the holidays. We just finished doing that um, as a church. We, we give out toys during the holidays. But those sustainable things are once in a life, once a, once a year events. We recognize that the issues that the community are facing is constant. It's not one, a one shop. A turkey is not going to fix what happens in January when they don't have enough food. But if we are able to create a program that ultimately teaches them how to have resume writing skills, talks to them about incarceration, helps them if they've been incarcerated to ensure that there's no more recidivism. We then have impacted this in community and we've created the opportunities to cause children to go to college that will then come back and feed into this community that will have growth. And we will see then that there are more organizations that are coming up. There are more people that are ready to make change. And so when we think about the Central Park Theater, 
when you think about what the work, what we're looking for, what is that? What, when you look at this building, um, historically, it has always been this cultural center that that's the, been the vision that Dr. Lincoln Scott wanted, that it was a place where you can come and get healing and wholeness, not just in church, but in every aspect of your life. That's what we see with the future. Um, and that's why this group that we work with is so powerful because that vision is something that each one of us believes in individually. So I appreciate your time um, and um, really am grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Trina. I think it's so great to hear uh, you talk about the future of the theater as well as the kind of tireless work that the church has been doing and how this project is a kind of extension of that um, effort to make change in a, in a community that I think um, is really excited and ready for it. Um, I'm going to welcome the other panelists back uh, on video. Um, I have questions for you all, but I'm starting to see some really interesting questions pop up in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to both encourage folks who are attending to throw additional questions in the Zoom Q&A function, um, and I'm going to actually start with one um, from Elizabeth Brown here. Um, Elizabeth says, thank you to all the speakers for sharing their experiences and ongoing efforts in preserving the important space of the Central Park Theater. In terms of the process of preservation, and I'm assuming here that that process is a complex network of relationships and bureaucracy, uh, what has been the biggest hurdles at an institutional level in securing the necessary funds to restore the space? It seems that the local community has made it clear that the theater is an important site for the North Lawndale neighborhood and have tirelessly advocated for its preservation. I'm also assuming here that public funds play a part in this project. So um, I think the question is, what is the biggest hurdles at an institutional level? And I'd really like to expand that um, for all of you to just identify what you think the biggest challenges are uh, to 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 bring to life the vision that Shoshana so so kind of beautifully shared with all of us. Um, since this starts as a preservation question, maybe we start with Mary Lou, and then we can we can head. Back. I'm sorry, Anne. Can you repeat the question one more time? I just got a yeah a text from a work project <laughs> that was sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. In terms of the process of preservation. What is the biggest hurdle in securing necessary funds to restore the space? <clears throat> well, it's not on the north side of Chicago or in downtown. That's the biggest hurdle, right? Um, um, the city of Chicago and banks, as Blanche talked about the history of redlining and the contract buyers club and um, the, the neighborhood of North Lawndale has been disinvested for decades. And um, we are trying to both restore a theater and overcome systemic racism and disinvestment all at the same time and engage with a community that uh, doesn't exactly embrace, um, you know, help from, they, they, they're not familiar with help from the city or people working really hard to invest in their community. So they're a little skeptical. They've seen it before. I mean, those are, those are really big hurdles from the community perspective. And I think everyone on our committee agrees that the committee, the community is the absolute focus and should be driving this. Um, and uh, we'll be, and the number is very large. That's the other, <laughs> we're, we're talking at, you know, anywhere from 12 to 25 to $30 million, depending on on the full scope of work that is settled on. And that's a that's a big chunk of change. And it's not a, again, if it, the Uptown Theater has been struggling and it's it's in a neighborhood that's a lot more stable. It's still, you know, Uptown's not uh, the pristine neighborhood, but um, that's been struggling to be revitalized and uh, it's, it's in a much more solid neighborhood, so. Blanche, you've been thinking about this for a long time. What do you see this, the biggest challenges to, to bringing this vision to life? Uh, like Mary Lou said, uh, number one, the, the community knows what it wants, um, getting the community engagement. And as I stated before, and Mary stated it too, North Lundell has been, a, the, from the six day riots, it has had a shadow over it. And that shadow has kind of depressed the history of the neighborhood. One of the biggest challenges we have right now is having Chicago take a second look or the first look of North Lundell of who and what it is. 
uh, we are located no place from downtown. Take you about five, 10 minutes to get downtown. People do not understand that the resiliency that's in North London, the survival rate, if you will. When I say survival, I don't mean your, your, your physical survival, but the survival of you being able to push forward is in North London. But when people look at the landscape, the disinvestment, the vacant lots, the first thing they think is that the community don't want anything. And this is not true, but you need help from the city, even to do a project like this. This is a historic landmark that needs to be recognized by the city of Chicago. First mechanically air conditioned theater, a theater that was developed and led other theaters in the city of Chicago, getting people to believe of who and what we are. We are a beacon of light for the, North, for, for the city of Chicago. As I named the three uh, uh, cultures that's been in North Londale, each one left a landmark. They left a mark on the community and those landmarks on the community from contract buy-in to the reinvestment act in housing, things like that. Things that got started in the Sears Roebuck and Company, the home of Sears Roebuck and Company. Uh, Julius Rosenwald there and, and thinking about go to my ear. Things like this, the city don't recognize on what North Lundell has done for the city of Chicago. So I think the biggest challenge for my organization is letting people know our history, not just the past, but the present. What we got going on in North Lundell now, the redevelopment or, or the redevelopment of Ogden Avenue, certain projects going on, we're making a U-turn. Unfortunately, a lot of that help did not come into play until certain, and I don't like to get on a political platform, but since Mayor Lightfoot has been there, this is the first time that I've seen such investment in neighborhoods such as Lundell, Inglewood, Garfield, that means so much to the city of Chicago, but was never recognized. So it's time for us to shine. We need help at the Central Park Theater to get started. The air and the, the heating system. You don't understand, and I say this kind of boldly, who you're dealing with. We are North Lundell and North Lundell Rock. You didn't recognize us before, but I guarantee you at the end of the day, you will understand what a jewel, a gem you got sitting right here in your city. We had a past mayor that I'm gonna get off my soapbox too that once said that this is gonna be a world-class city. North Lundell is a world-class neighborhood. I'm off my box, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing in the chat that uh, folks, uh, uh, Blanche, you're, that you're such a fierce leader that we could listen to you all day. I, I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> Um, Toshona, what do you see as the biggest challenges? I know you've been you've been um, both uh, with the church, uh, preserving this building, fighting for it, and kind of identifying the vision now for for years. What 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 are the challenges that you you identify uh, out out in front of? I would say ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, it is very political. It is very much so where the money is going to be routed. Um, it is, we've, and we've been in conversations as a church with key players in Chicago um, in the buildings and development who want to work. But once you kind of like are on this list of violations, you are like working through this, this, um, cloud, I, that's the best way to say it, of negativity that you have to get them to see. I mean, Pastor Marshall's a different owner. He's a different pastor, but you, it doesn't separate from what they felt happened before. Um, and ultimately, it's needed. It's 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 the community. Um, it, even if it's I, I, I often, one of the things we say at church often is if we don't do the work, 
somebody has to do it, right? So it's not about, well, it's, it's just our vision. We recognize there, there's real work that's needed. There's real work, there's real trauma that has been experienced or real people who have been hurt. And you have to have someone that says, it's not about money. It's not about, we're, we're not in it to make money. We're in it to change the change the lives. Um, and so it's a community. I've seen, um, I've seen the change of the community. My grandmother used to live right around the corner from the church. I mean, we would walk from her house to church. Um, even just that, even just seeing how the the, the house has been taken, and they they want to push out a certain community and pull in another one. Um, those are things you're fighting against. Not you know. You have to have the right people on your side. You have to have people that don't believe that just buying it from under us and changing it is the answer, that preserving it and allowing those who know the community to heal itself. Um, we use a, to not be spiritual, but to use this, we talk about physicians, heal thyself, right? Physician, heal thyself, allow us to be the physicians for our own community. Um, and sometimes what we're really fighting right now is, uh, regentrification. We're fighting this idea that you push the other everyone out, pull, push them out further, farther away, and you take this community back, and then you allow people to come in with more money to do it. That's not always the answer to solving the problems that are there. So, yeah, no, I, I thank you, and I, I really appreciate that. And I think, especially as a as an architect, it, I, I I think folks, it's easy to see buildings as as the the their building violations or their their crumbling parapets or their their you know um, heat needing to be upgraded, but the the vision for this building and its role and its potential to be a catalyst is just so much more than that. And I think that you you and Blanche both kind of bring forward this idea that a change in consciousness is one of the biggest challenges that that we that we face. And um, Manuel, maybe this is a way to bring this question to you too. Um, one of the attendees has asked um, whether you are inspired by a similar restoration or project in your country. And I was curious if maybe there, um, in your work, uh, you've identified kind of similar challenges um, in different places or ideas um, that might be able to kind of spark new ways of thinking about restoring or reviving the Central Park Theater. Um, great, uh, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm joined by my little boy who might um, uh, say a, a few things uh, also, um, but uh, uh, I hope it's not, um, uh, doesn't distract. Anyway, um, first of all, um, uh, thank you for the, um, uh, whoever asked this uh, uh, for the uh, kind of positive uh, remark. Um, uh, uh, I, I think one main reason I, I work together with a fantastic art, artist, Thomas Melvin, who you brought in, uh, and, uh, uh, and that was uh, one of the really main factors um, and this kind of ping pong between the two of us, uh, or the, the many of us, uh, to, to make this uh, really into a fantastic project. Um, one word about uh, previous work also is that I, I'm kind of interested in this um, play of um, the past in the present, but also the three-dimensionality and the two-dimensionality and how this kind of falls into each other, which uh, certainly takes place on the wall of the theater today. And, and um, this is maybe some of the inspiration um, uh, that, that uh, shaped the project. Um, but um, uh, uh, in, I, I think what, what has happened here um, now in the last few weeks, Maxki. Um, is, is really, in a way, uh, uh, the, 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 re the good path um, that with very simple uh, uh, tools, uh, we've created quite an attention. Uh, and, and I think I wouldn't go from now from uh, just a few hundred or thousand dollars to $30 million in one step. Uh, but I, I think this kind of step-by-step -step, uh, approach is, is correct, is wise. <clears throat> the reuse of the existing um, and the the power of the visual. Um, uh, no, that's at least when I speak as an architect, we can create an attention with relatively minimal means uh, and 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 kind of show uh, what is happening in North Lawndale with relatively um, uh, smallish uh, means uh, that can attract much much more. Uh, and this kind of seductive power of of the visual, I think we should uh, make use of. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, 
see what could be the next step, not to go from now, as I said, from uh, zero to 30 million, but um, um, with a, a kind of interstitial step, <clears throat> um, how can we attract attention? How can we radiate this to the world? Uh, how important this is? And, and uh, then, um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if it, 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 I don't want to sound conservative if I say, take it step by step. Um, but uh, uh, on the other hand, I want to kind of use the seduction of architecture also uh, with minimal means uh, to, to raise awareness of the history and the potential of the site. Uh, thank you so much. I see, yeah, Max, Max trying to make a, a break for it there. But um, no, I think we, we all, the, the idea of step-by-step -step really resonates with this team. Um, and also the sense that your work, I think even the kind of conversations about who should be you know, shown in the mural and uh, digging up pictures of, of, of Pastor Lincoln Scott and, and talking about what gospel greats played there and trying to uh, dig up the, the, the floor plans of the adjacent buildings. It was a way of showing that um, the Central Park Theater isn't just one thing at one point in time, right? But actually has been authored and designed and maintained and preserved by a whole range of voices and, and will continue to, to be that way in the future. Um, I see we are running close on time, but I just wanted to ask, I, I'm seeing a, a, a few very sweet comments come in in, in the Q&A and I, I really appreciate the folks who are here today. Um, I just wanted to ask one more question maybe to, to Blanche and to, to Shona. Um, I think it's been my privilege to be able to hear from you both many personal stories about the theater um, which have resonated why the building is significant for you. Um, I know as this project goes forward, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be in the press for, for, for uh, the, the kind of vision of the project and its architectural significance and so on. But I was wondering if each of you could share a personal story from your own lives about why this building is significant and, and what it means to you before we sign off today. Sure, I will. Um, for the, those of you in the audience, um, I went to the Central Park Theater when I was quite young. I'm from the South. And when we came to the, when I came to that theater with my brothers and sisters, we were allowed to sit on the main level. And then back in my day down South, we couldn't. We had to go upstairs. And when you walk through the glass doors that leads to the auditorium there, you feel like you're walking in a place where you never was allowed, but now you belong, you belong. So I felt like royalty with no crown. And to meet Reverend Lincoln Scott, who I knew when he was still in charge of the theater, and to go up there and speak with him about his vision of helping the community and, and, and embracing the community, I always tell people that one thing you must always remember, your community is you. You make up your community. What you see it is, what it is, is what you make it. So as a child going to that theater and sitting there, like I said, I felt like a queen had got her crown and watching and sitting in a certain aisle where they would run off the stage and go through the aisle and shake your hand and to be able to sit there and receive that, it was wonderful. Uh, there was physicians in that building at one time on the second floor. I went to the psychiatrist there. So I have a long history with that theater and it means so much to me for your people to come into the theater, not just the theater, come into North Lundell and see who we are. I guarantee you, as I told Ann there, will you stick around us enough? You're gonna wanna call this your home. And I'm gonna do a quote right quick from, uh, there was an exhibit done with the Chicago Architectural Foundation, the North Lundell community and some other people. And it said that the history of North Lundell touches the larger history of the city of Chicago and of the United States in multiple intriguing ways. To speak to a resident or to speak to Blanche of North Lundell today or yesterday leads quickly to a focus on how the neighborhood came in to be what it is and what is becoming. 
The Historical Society has recently done interviews with not just people that went to the theater, but people that lived in the community doing the available city exposition. I was honored to have Manuel come in and show his work. If you look at that mural that's on the wall, you got doors there. And I want you to imagine people standing at those doors saying, hey, come on in. You got Reverend Lincoln Scott on the front end saying, this is the house of prayer. What does that mean? A place, it didn't say that a place where you got to be a certain denomination. It's a place, as Mother Scott said, where you can come in and receive the blessings that you deserve. So knowing those Benny Goodman on the back end, world-known, well-known musician, playing right there at that theater, you cannot deny history like that. And myself, you can't deny my history of that theater. Um, when I talked to Reverend Marsha about the theater, and you as a group know that at times I will get very tearful about North Lundell because I always tell people, this is a place where you can get holistic healing, you can get community bonding, don't bleed the hype. That's, that's all I got to say. I appreciate everybody that attended today. And I look forward to you not only visiting the theater, but you can do a North Mondale through the Historical Society. Let me show you exactly why I love this community. Thank you. I will, um, I will bring us home. Yes, I, I will. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if the committee has heard this story, but um, and today when Mary Lou shared those pictures, oh my gosh, I had forgotten that that's how the theater looked. Um, my family joined, um, well, my grandmother had been there for a while, but my dad, my mom and I, my sister, we joined in 1991. It was a time where we were living in a very bad neighborhood. We did not have a lot of money. Um, we were kind of really down on our luck. And I remember my dad had went to a lot of different churches and people talked about whatever the struggle was. Um, but Dr. Scott was the first person when we walked into that Central Park Theater that talked to him like a man that spoke to him, not where he was at, but where he was going. And it was at House of Prayer. It was through that Central Park Theater and going to those services. And we went literally every day for 40 days praying with Dr. Scott. If you knew anything about Dr. Scott, he made you go in there. You was on that hard concrete and you prayed. Um, but our lives changed. And I can't put into words what that means, but we went, I, I can tell you this, my dad went from being jobless to being an educator. We went from bad schools to great schools to graduating from college. And it was because Dr. Scott didn't see us as this family that didn't have anything. He kept speaking to our future. Just as he believed in the shelter, the homeless shelter, he believed in what every family that came through that door could happen. And now fast forward, we're in 2021. My dad is now the pastor. This man who came in barely with, we didn't even have a car, uh, barely had resources now pastoring the church. My sister and I now living these lives that would not have happened had we not come in contact with this theater. We were, I, mean, I could tell you stories. We were, we lost everything in a fire. And the first person that showed up was Dr. Scott with, with, all the resources and it was right in that theater that we were able to get couches and blankets and when i tell you lost everything clothes on our back were all we had and it was really because of that vision and so when i think about that theater it is a place that really has changed my life and i know for a fact my dad and i say this all the time had we not come in contact with that place we would have been somewhere in squalor may have not even been alive because that was really the life we were facing when you don't have a job when you don't have an outlet when you don't have a, a way for it you feel like it's the end of the world and here was this man in this crazy building we some days didn't even have heat but he believed that each person that this building was a place where people could come to find hope. That was what he died believing. And that is what we are trying to carry on. If I can help one family, if this theater 
this restoration committee can help one family do what we did, my work, I felt like I've paid it forward and that's what the theater means to me. Thank you so much, Shakona. Um, we are running out of time. I see our uh, friends and colleagues throwing in the chat and there are two links. Um, one is for a GoFundMe for some um, triage uh, uh, repair that we need to do on the building uh, in, in the short term. And then also Jake shared a petition um, to support the landmarks uh, uh, process for the Central Park Theater. So um, if you're interested in learning more or you want to support the project, you can you can follow along at those two sites. Um, thank you, everyone who who spoke um, for your for your. Um, I, I I I don't even really have good words to describe how I'm feeling about this. And um, the project uh, is is so inspiring, but mostly because of everyone uh, who is part of it um, and 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 all the vision that you bring to the table. Um, I will kick it to Marguerite uh, for any wrap up comments uh, to to conclude the panel. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Anne and to Shona and Manuel and Blanche and Mary Lou for being with us today and to our great audience. And we look forward to welcoming you back next week for another one of our In Dialogue series. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Max. It was great seeing you. <laughs>